It is amazing to me that we began this season on Ash Wednesday. We began the series Love Is on Ash Wednesday. And now here we are on Good Friday, on Monday, Thursday, on the verge of celebrating Easter. And this season has flown by. And tonight is the final message in the Love Is series. Remember how we started all of that? It was that coincidence of Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday coming together. We thought, what a perfect combination. What an incredible illustration. And so all of this time, we've been working our way through a section of Scripture that is extremely well known. Many of you probably use this scripture for your marriage as it was read, and it talks about love. It's the best biblical picture of love probably of any of the descriptors. It's Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 13. Read along if you, uh, if you like. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. It will come to an end. As we uh, finish out this series, there are three reflections that I think you may relate to with regard to love and as we've come to understand it from Paul's description as the Holy Spirit inspired him and as Paul shared it in these beautiful words. Number one, the characteristics of love, these characteristics that we just read through, these things that describe what love is and what love is not, the characteristics of love count. They matter. You know, sometimes we, we think about love as, as being nice, and we think about these characteristics as being nice. So isn't that nice? Well, generally speaking, if something is nice, it doesn't really change things. It may be respected or honored or, or considered something good, but it doesn't have the power of something that we take seriously. Paul takes these characteristics extremely seriously. And as we've looked at the scripture, think about it. So love is patient. Well, remember, we took a look at Saul, King Saul, and Saul lost his entire kingdom because he wasn't patient. Love is not envious. Remember, we looked at the whole story, the whole, the whole scenario with regard to Jesus' death, his crucifixion. And remember, he was crucified from a human standpoint. He was crucified because of the envy of the religious leaders. Love rejoices with the truth. Remember that story from the life of Joshua and how it was that Achan took things that didn't belong to him and then concealed them in his tent. He tried to cover it up, pretended like it didn't happen. And the reality is that his, his lack of truthfulness literally resulted in Achan's death and suffering on the part of Israel. No, the Bible takes these characteristics of love very seriously. So does Paul. The question is, what about you and me? Do we take them seriously? Take them seriously enough to, to think about the places where we're doing it right and celebrate those and think about the places where we're falling short, where we're making mistakes and repent of those. And ask for God's spirit to help us change our sinful lives. Because the characteristics of love count, and they count in our lives. They count in our loving. Second observation, the characteristics of love challenge. They're a significant challenge. If we're taking it seriously, if we're taking it to heart, if we understand this is what love is to be, and if we're going to love as God has loved us, that we're supposed to live out these characteristics, it becomes challenging because sometimes we don't feel like being patient, but love is patient. Sometimes we're tempted to tell a lie because it seems more convenient than owning up to something. We want to cover our trail. The fact of the matter is, dear friends, 
we, we live in a, a culture where too often love is thought of as a feeling. And that we're, we're carried along in this life by all kinds of feelings, including love, and it forces us into different situations, and it motivates us to do certain things, and it has something, some kind of control over us that supersedes our minds. That's nonsense. Love is about a commitment to all of these characteristics, about a decision, a, a commitment to live out these characteristics in our relationships with other people. In fact, if we really take this seriously, it's worth putting together a little checklist and asking ourselves from time to time, how am I doing? Think about these characteristics of love in relationship to your, your love for your spouse or your love for your children or your love for your parents or your love for your friends. How am I doing? Am I living these out or am I just kind of coasting along, acting as if the love that I have for these people is a mere feeling because that's the wrong direction? Love is a commitment. Love is a choice. So number one observation, the characteristics of love count. Number two, the characteristics of love challenge us. Number three, the characteristics of love conquer. They conquer hate. They conquer depravity. They even conquer death. We'll see that in just a few minutes. I love this Last verse of the chapter. Now these three remain. Do you know this verse? Say it if you know it. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. There's a reason Paul has to use so many characteristics to describe love. It's because love is so many different things. It's expressed and it's lived out in so many different ways, in so many different situations. That brings us to our text for tonight. Because if, if Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 is kind of the textbook on love, then Jesus in John 13 is the object lesson of love. And so we're going to take a look beginning in John 13, verse 1. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, that's the, the CSB version, right? We've been using that this year and we'll continue to use it. But, you know, every once in a while I long for the old NIV that we used for years. Because there are subtle differences. And you probably will recognize this version of that verse just a little bit better. Having loved his own who were with, having loved him, loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Don't you love that? He's gonna show them how wide and how high and how deep, how vast. How incredible his love is. And so he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel and tied it around himself. Next he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. Let's just spend these last few moments and let's take a, a good hard look at what Jesus does at how he loves. And let's use this as we, as we think about how Jesus loves. Let's think about how that impacts not only our life and our faith, but how it is that we can leave this night loving even better than we started. So number one, how did Jesus love? Jesus gives up himself in love. Notice it says that he got up from the supper. Well, what supper are we talking about? Not a trick question. The Last Supper, right? The time when he gave that first communion. Jesus is there with his disciples. He gets up from the supper and he goes to, to wash his disciples' feet. Now think about this whole picture. So Jesus takes off his outer garment and he puts this towel around himself and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. We all say, well, wow, that's really servant-hearted of him. But you need to understand the significance of this. 
Washing people's feet was something that happened all the time. Remember, as they're walking around, they're walking around with sandals, their, their toes are open, their feet are exposed, and, and as they're walking along, they're not walking along pavement or carpet or, or other kinds of places that are relatively clean. They're walking in dust and dirt and mud. And so the feet had to be washed, but it was the lowest job, the lowest of the low washed feet. In fact, there are lots of rabbinic traditions that, that suggest that even a Jewish slave, a Jewish servant should never wash feet. That was something that was left for the Gentiles, the least in the whole culture. In fact, Pastor Zach found a, a story about one Jewish rabbi named Ishmael who went to visit his mom and as a, as a way of honoring her son and, and showing love for her son, she prepared to wash his feet and he was so horrified. He said, absolutely not, you will not wash my feet. And they got into a, a little bit of an altercation. They ultimately ended up going to court over whether or not she should be able to wash his feet. And it will come, to no, come as no surprise to the moms in the crowd that the mom won. <laughs> but you get the point. This was abhorrent. This was absolutely an indignity. And yet Jesus, Jesus is washing his disciples' feet. That probably also helps you understand Peter's reaction, right? When it comes time for his feet to be washed by his Lord, his teacher, his rabbi, his Messiah, remember what Peter says? No way, you will never wash my feet. Do you remember what Jesus said? If I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. You know, it's interesting. I was reading an article earlier. It's an article about a, a woman who had to undergo a transplant. It's kind of on my mind because one of our dear members is facing a, a dual organ transplant. In fact, some of you have seen on Facebook, I've asked for prayers and, and so forth. It's a, it's a traumatic thing. I, it's tender in my heart because my brother Ed has gone through two kidney transplants. Well, this dear woman became aware of the fact that she was in stage four liver failure as a, as a surprise. She knew she wasn't feeling well, but she didn't expect that kind of verdict and, and discovered that she had about two months to live and she needed a liver transplant. That doesn't leave enough time. Usually to find a match, it takes more time than that. But, but interestingly enough, one of her relatives was, was working as a seasonal employee and he was talking about his cousin and talking about her need for this transplant. And this young man, this Marine, heard her talking, volunteered to be tested, found out that he was a match, and without ever having met this woman, without even ever knowing her, gave her 55% of his liver. Pretty amazing, don't you think? But you know what happened? This woman was so taken with the extraordinary generosity, literally to give a part of his body to save her life without knowing her. She was so taken with his generosity that they began to form a relationship. And lo and behold, they fell in love. That relationship got deeper and deeper until ultimately they were married. And I think that's such a beautiful picture of what happens in the Lord's Supper. When Jesus gives himself in love for us, literally, he gives us his body and his blood. He literally comes into us to save us. We desperately need those elements and he gives them. In fact, that's, that's really when we talk about what's here at the altar, what do we have? Well, if you take a look under the, under the covers, we've got bread and we've got wine, right? But we know and we believe in something called the real presence, that, that we understand that just beneath the bread and just beneath the wine, just there within it, there's also body and blood. That these elements are at the same time bread and body and wine and blood and they are held together and we receive them.
and it deepens our relationship. It strengthens our faith, it forgives our sins, it unites us with all believers, but it deepens our relationship in gratitude. We recognize the extraordinary generosity of this Jesus who would give himself in love for you and me. Lesson number two that we learn from Jesus is that he gives up his dignity for love. You know, at the end of this service, a, a significant part of what we will do, while it doesn't take a, a large amount of time, there's a, a powerful kind of visual. The pastors and, and elders and I will, will strip the altar of all of its pyramids, of all of its parts and pieces. And it symbolizes something very powerful, the stripping of Jesus, the stealing of his dignity, that literally he gives all of that, all of that for us. You know, when we realize what has happened, it, it sort of makes me think about a time years ago. How many dads with daughters? Okay. So having sons and daughters, there's a big difference. My sons have never asked to paint my toenails. <laughs> my daughter, Kate, used to every once in a while. And I remember one particular time. I was going on a, a class trip with one of the junior high classes years ago. And, and so I had been running around. I, I put things in. I had a crazy hat that I was wearing. I had crazy sunglasses that I was wearing. Everything was ready. The only thing I hadn't had a chance to do was change into my flip-flops that I was going to wear on the bus. And so I got on the bus, took my shoes off, put them in the bag, only to realize this was Tuesday. On Sunday night, Kate had said, Dad, can I, can I polish your toes? With pink toe polish? And so there I was, too late to turn back. My feet hanging out for everybody to see. You can imagine those junior high boys, their shock and awe. Yeah. But you know, the funny thing was, I didn't feel embarrassed about it. It actually was kind of a badge of honor. That my daughter loved me enough to want to do that, and I loved her enough to let her do that. Understand, this isn't about indignity for Jesus. This is about his mission. It's about his passion. It is about his unwavering desire to love you and me beyond dignity, to love us to eternal life. In Hebrews 12, it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus the source and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that, that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. So it's saying, for the, for the joy, for the wonderful thing waiting there before him, he endured the cross. So what is that joy? What is that wonderful thing that, that kept him focused, that kept him on track, that he was looking at and he knew he could go through the suffering and torment of dying on the cross? It was you and me. The joy that was laid out for him was the joy of giving himself completely, surrendering his dignity willingly so that you and I could have life and life abundant. So Jesus shows his love by, by giving himself up in love. He shows us his love by giving up his dignity in love. Finally, Jesus shows his love because he gives up his life for love. He literally gives all that he has. You know, if we go back to that same passage that I read to you, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. We talked about the, the full extent, the breadth, the height, the depth that he would give himself literally, that he would give up his dignity literally. But if we go back to the CSB version, it brings out a nuance that I think we should pay attention to. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them 
to the end. What end? His end. Do you remember his words? It is finished to the end of his mission. But beyond that, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathes his last and he dies. To the end of his life for us. You know, we live in a crazy world. We live in a world where love gets all kinds of bad press and all kinds of confusing press. But when we think about the love of Jesus, the thing that is crystal clear is that the love of Jesus provides a foundation for us, provides a a launch pad, provides a, a safe place to stand in a stormy, frightening, overwhelming, confusing world. Yeah, I was thinking about that in terms of our congregation. You've probably noticed that we've done all kinds of upgrades, trying to make things a a little better, trying to improve the the lightings, for example, trying to improve the the appearance of things, just trying to make the worship experiences as good as we can and making constant improvement. And one of the things that you may not be aware of is that we've been working on the video part, trying to make the the cameras better, trying to improve the, the way things look on the screens and as we broadcast over the internet. You may not know it, but between 500 and 1,000 people stream our services every week. We want that to grow, and so we're trying to make it as, as user-friendly and as pleasant an experience as possible, and part of that is, is improving the cameras. Well, you know, we've got a, a tiny little problem with one of our cameras. And it has to do with That camera right there. And it has to do with the way our sanctuary is built. Now, I love our sanctuary. But if you you don't know, that sanctuary is built with cantilevered steel beams. I mean, these are massive steel beams. I mean, this thing, it's built. It looks sort of like it could fall down. It can't fall down. All of San Antonio will collapse, and that, that balcony will still be there. But because of the way it's designed, when there are lots of people in the balcony and they're moving around and that camera is mounted right on the front of the balcony, guess what happens? If you're up there, it may freak you out. Don't go up there if it's going to freak you out, okay? You maybe never noticed it. Now you'll be up there and thinking about it the whole time. But if you've watched, every once in a while, there's a little shake in the camera. And we've been trying to figure out how we can how we can get rid of that. Had lots of ideas. One particular idea that stands out in my mind is that Pastor Zach wanted to install a cable and do like that stadium flyover camera, you know. <laughs> you have no idea how much I have to watch that guy. <laughs> but one of the things that we've thought about is mounting it to those pillars. See, the balcony will never fall down, but it'll shake. Those pillars will not shake. Those pillars were like the first thing that was constructed. Those pillars are are poured in place concrete, and they are loaded with steel. And the reality is that even if that balcony does fall, fall down, those pillars will stand. Jesus' love is like those pillars. Our world can't shake it. Our sin can't rock it. His love is immovable and it's absolutely constant for us. Or as it says in Lamentations chapter three, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. When does it stop? Okay, I know it's close to bedtime, but not that close. When does God's love stop? Never. Never. I don't know about you, but I need to remember that. 
I need to remember that every single day. And in fact, dear friends, that's why 2,000 years later, every time we receive this sacrament, every time we take the body and blood of Jesus, we are reminded that his steadfast love never ceases. It's his steadfast love for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you have a love that is unshakable and immovable, that you are with us in that love always. And tonight, as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive this holy meal, we ask that you would strengthen our faith to put our trust in you above all other things, above all people, above all resources, above all theories and philosophies, that our trust would be in you above all things and that you would meet us here in this meal to give us that which we need the most, your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we continue our service tonight, we not only remember Christ's love for us, we receive Christ's love for us in a simple form and yet in a profound way in Holy Communion. You know, Scripture tells us that when we receive a gift from God, we don't receive it because we're somehow worthy. We're not. We've all sinned and we've all fallen short of God. And so as we come to receive a gift from God, we always come in humility and in repentance. But we also come in faith knowing that our God is in the business of giving us that which we don't deserve. That's what the cross is all about. And so we receive a precious gift tonight in, with, and under this bread and this wine. We receive the love of God in the body and the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. You know, this name for this meal, communion, it's meant to show us how we are in community with God and with each other. We often call it the family meal of the church. And so we want families to come. If you have a child who hasn't yet been confirmed in the faith, they're welcome to come forward as well. All we ask is they cross their arms like this and our communion attendants will give them a blessing as they pass by. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said to them, take and eat, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after the supper, Christ took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said to them, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is my blood of the New Testament, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Welcome to the Lord's table.
As we continue tonight, we go to God in prayer, and as we do so, I'd invite you to kneel, or you can also remain seated where you are. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing love. We thank you for a love that is so deep and so wide and so broad that it would move you to send your one and only Son into the world for us. We thank you that his love moves him to give his body and his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for that precious gift, and we thank you that we have received that precious gift tonight. Heavenly Father, may we never despise or lose sight of the greatness of your love. You loved us so much that you sent your one and only Son, so that when we believe, we can have forgiveness, life, and salvation. We thank you for that, and we pray in the name of the one who gives us that, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now together we pray the prayer that he's taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, Yet I have no rest. But you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you rescued them. They cried to you and were set free. They trusted in you and were not disgraced. But I am a worm and not a man, 
scorned by mankind and despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads. He relies on the Lord. Let him save him. Let the Lord rescue him, since he takes pleasure in him. It was you who brought me out of the womb, making me secure at my mother's breast. I was given over to you at birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Don't be far from me, because distress is near and there's no one to help me. Many bulls surround me, strong ones of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me, lions mauling and roaring. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax, melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You put me into dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves, and they cast lots of my clothing. But you, Lord, don't be far away. My strength, come quickly to help me. Rescue my life from the sword, my only life from the power of these dogs. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen. You answered me. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the assembly. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. All you descendants of Israel, revere him. For he has not despised or abhorred the torment of the oppressed. He did not hide his face from him, but listened when he cried to him for help. I will give praise in the great assembly because of you. I will fulfill my vows because of those who fear you. The humble will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families and nations will bow down before you. For kingships belong to the Lord, and he rules the nations. All who prosper on earth will eat and bow down. All those who go down to dust will kneel before him, even the one who cannot preserve his life. Their descendants will serve him. The next generation will be told about the Lord. They will come and declare his righteousness. To a people yet to be born, they will declare what he has done. <laughs> 